Alright, good morning Queensland and uh, happy Valentine's everybody. Hope you all get something nice. Okay, so we'll do the COVID update first and then uh, we've got a significant announcement today about uh, health and then we're happy to move on to other questions. So we've got 3,750 new cases including 2,426 positive rats. Uh, tragically, um, there have been six people who've lost their lives uh, overnight and once again, on behalf of Queensland families, I pass on my condolences uh, to our loved ones during this time. I'm advised three were in aged care. Uh, in terms of our numbers in our public hospitals, the Chief Health Officer will give a little bit more about that, but there's 484 in our public hospitals and 30 in private, 41 in ICU, 20 ventilated. Uh, vaccine coverage, not much movement there, 92.36% at least one dose and 90.31% double dose. Boosters, 61.59%. 5 to 11 year olds, 41.12% of eligible children. Once again, parents, please um, have a serious think about getting your children vaccinated if you haven't. Um, that would be great. And uh, the rats just keep on coming in. So that's good that they're coming in now and going out to the centres uh, that need them the most. So I'll hand over to the Chief Health Officer and then the Health Minister, and then we'll move on to our next announcement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Premier. So sadly, we have six deaths to report today. Uh, one person in their 50s, one in their 60s, one in their 80s and two in their 90s. Of these six individuals, one was not vaccinated, one had received one dose of vaccine, four had received two doses of vaccine, and none had received the booster dose. Uh, also of this group, three were known to be um, eight residents of uh, aged care facilities. That brings to a total of 200 the number of uh, deaths in aged care facilities we're, we've reported in Queensland. And our thoughts are with the families today. In terms of hospitalisations, I think I've mentioned many times that um, Mondays, Tuesdays, because of the weekly fluctuation in discharge, we tend to see a flattening in, of cases. So we have 484 uh, people in public hospitals uh, today, which is slightly up from yesterday, 462, but that's just part of that weekly variation we tend to see that uh, we tend not to see, we tend to see the numbers start to fall from about Wednesday during the course of the week. Uh, there are 40 people in intensive care unit Intensive care, intensive care units, public intensive care units in Queensland, uh, 20 of whom are ventilated. And we also know that the numbers of people in intensive care tend to be come down more slowly than the number in, in hospitals in general. In our private hospitals, we have 30 patients with COVID, including one in ICU, and there were 34 yesterday. Uh, so far, we have not seen any increase in uh, cases in school-aged children. There were 963 cases reported in the past 24 hours, 527 in the 5 to 11 age group and 436 in the 12 to 17 age, year age group. Uh, it's only been just on a week since, they, since children have gone back to school, so what will happen this week will certainly be very interesting. We'll be watching that very closely. And again, I'll repeat that... Um, we had very significant numbers of cases in children three weeks ago which have been coming down. So the degree of immunity in school-aged children is still not clear. So exactly what is going to happen over the next week or two among children in school isn't clear, but we'll, we'll learn in the next few days whether the numbers do, do or do not increase. I'll hand over to the Minister. Thank you. Well, it's great to see the numbers continuing to come down and the pressure continuing to come off our hospital system. As the Chief Health Officer said, you know, we always see slightly higher numbers as far as hospital beds on a Monday morning, uh, but it's good to see that our ICU numbers have come down again from 44 yesterday to 40 today. Uh, and we've seen a um, slight decline in private beds as well, down from 34 to 30. So that's really good. It continues to show a bit of a trend there. And even uh, our modelling is showing we're still seeing uh, a decline in the number of positive cases across children as well. So we're not, after one week of school, I know it's still early, cross fingers, but uh, we're not seeing a big surge at this stage as far as school going back and the number of staff that we have quarantining and isolating has gone down as well. We now have 1,745 
staff across Queensland Ambulance Service and our hospital and health services that are isolating and quarantining down from 1,817 yesterday. So that's all great news, uh, but I do want to continue to encourage people to come forward and get tested, whether it's a rapid antigen test or a PCR test if they do have symptoms. Uh, also, of course, registering on the Queensland COVID website if you do get a positive rapid antigen test at home and of course coming out and getting vaccinated and it's good to see those numbers continuing to go up. In fact, our 12 year old and above uh, for our population here in Queensland is almost at 90% double dose as well, which is great news, but I would like to see uh, the number of children, both uh, five to 11 and 12 to 15 year old. I'd like to see those percentages come up and thank you to people who continue to come out and get their booster because we're over 61% now. Uh, but we'd like to see that 100% rate. If you are uh, due for your booster, please come forward. GP, community pharmacy, or one of our state-run vaccination clinics, you can walk in or book to get those vaccinations. Any questions for the Chief Health Officer or the Health Minister on COVID? Yeah, I've got yep. one for the Minister's Arthur, um, just yep. quickly. Uh, how, how long will these daily briefings be taking place? Are, are you going to scale back, given that the numbers are coming down and we're seeing figures every day? Thanks, Josh. Well, I, I smile because we had that conversation this morning. Uh, you know, I think we are getting closer uh, to be able to simply put the the numbers up and report them uh, yeah, at a, a consistent time every day, unless there is something out of the ordinary uh, or um, particularly important that we believe needs to be reported at press conferences. Not quite yet there yet, but I think we're very close. Uh, if we continue to see this trend happening for the next few days. So, uh, but again, if the public really you know, wants it, then we'll continue to report. But I think we are getting closer. And I know many other jurisdictions have stopped doing their daily reporting at press conferences on this. Look, that's really a decision for the clinicians, for the chief health officers at AHPPC. I know there's you know, discussions uh, ongoing on this. I know internationally some of it's down to five days now. So we'll take the advice of the health officers on that one. Oh, we think that, that there are some people uh, who have held out for an alternative vaccine. Uh, as, as you know, we, I don't think it was necessary, but there are some people who wanted a, a more conventional protein-based vaccine, and so I think it, our numbers will increase somewhat. Uh, in terms of the long-term plan, it's not really going to influence our long-term plan. I think we're, we're moving steadily forward uh, now that this, this wave is uh, coming to an end, and we'll be reviewing all of our plans in the next uh, couple of weeks. Oh, COVID, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, Lydia. Yeah. Parliament uh, Well, I'm, I'm confident uh, within my office uh, they have been. Uh, we can find out for you, but uh, you can't enter Parliament unless you're vaccinated. That's the ruling from the Speaker. Uh, no, not to my knowledge. No, no. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, well, today um, we have another uh, key announcement, and that's in relation to our satellite hospitals. At the last election, we we said that we were going to build seven satellite hospitals. This is to ease our pressure on our bigger hospitals and have them located uh, closer to where people live. And this area here is uh, the site of our seventh uh, satellite hospital, which now means we have acquired all of the land. The detailed planning and design is uh, definitely underway with the others, and we expect construction to be uh, commencing on all of them uh, by the end of this year. This is gonna be really good for our families and patients, especially tell me they wanna get their services closer to home, whether that's uh, things like uh, chemotherapy or renal dialysis, uh, this is going to be great to be able to get your treatment closer to home. Uh, no more travelling into the big hospitals. This was a landmark um, election commitment and one that my government is very keen to deliver as quickly and safely as possible. The seven satellite hospital sites are in Eight Mile Plains, which is where we are standing today. And as you can see, a great um, parcel of land here. 
and I'm quite sure the families living around here are going to be extremely happy as well. Uh, Caboolture, Redlands, Pine Rivers, Tugan, Bribey Island and Ripley. So we absolutely hope that this will ease some of the pressure on our EDs. There will be 773 jobs uh, created um, as a result of all of these satellite hospitals that will begin construction uh, later this year. And this is fantastic news, especially for our employment and making sure that people have a job and be able to have a roof over their head and provide for their families. These are fundamental core values that we stand for as a Labor government. Uh, I know that the community is very excited about these satellite hospitals and hopefully in the future we'll be able to look at rolling out more, but we'll have to evaluate that first. We're looking forward to getting them up and running as quickly and safely as possible to provide these services uh, closer to home. I'll hand over to the Health Minister, uh, then we've got uh, the Treasurer to say a few words and we've got the local members here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. And this is an exciting day that we have uh, secured the last site in the seven satellite hospitals. Uh, and in doing so means that we can start construction later this year and have these sites operational in 2023. And the difference this will make uh, is that we're bringing healthcare closer to the communities and taking pressure off our major hospitals. And the way that it does that, there are many, many health services that we deliver inside our major hospitals that don't need to be there. Outpatients, dialysis, oncology, minor injuries. These things can be done closer to the communities in other facilities, such as these satellite hospitals, that free up space in our big hospitals. I know locally in my area, that meant we freed up an entire floor by moving our dialysis and oncology out of the hospital. Uh, and meant we could establish a whole new ward. That's extra hospital beds, overnight beds, by creating space in our hospitals. And we know the difficulty of people coming and parking and going to outpatients and uh, going to those sort of services in our big hospitals and how busy they can be. So this is a great initiative. I am very confident that this will make a big impact on our hospital system and taking pressure off our hospitals at a time when we know the demand is increasing constantly uh, and it's delivering for the local communities. And I want to acknowledge Janine Walker here today who is the chair of Metro South Hospital and Health Board and the support of Metro South in securing this site uh, and helping planning. There'll be lots of consultation that goes on over coming weeks about exactly what services are suitable for each individual satellite hospital. What's the demands of those communities to make sure we get the mix right for each one of those communities? The Palaszczuk Government Satellite Hospital Program is an Australian first and today we're locking in the seventh location. It's ideally located between QE2 and Logan Hospital. That's exactly what we were looking for. Locations that are easier for patients to get to, easier and cheaper for patients to park at, uh, but also uh, allows us to decant services from our tertiary hospitals, the most expensive real estate uh, in our health system and move them here, uh, creating capacity uh, in our uh, creating capacity in our hospitals. Uh, so this is a fantastic program, and I'm really looking forward to seeing construction begin. Well, the announcement today is great news for the south side of Brisbane and for the city of Logan, and from my perspective, particularly uh, for the state electorate of uh, Woodridge that I'm so proud to represent in the Queensland Parliament. Uh, the site of this satellite hospital will be just so accessible. It's close to ma major motorways, it's close to, close to major arterial roads, it's close uh, to major bus uh, stops and bus routes, and it's close to the busway. Uh, very importantly, it will complement the work and support the work of two large um, uh, tertiary hospitals, the QE2 hospital and the Logan hospital. For people living in my community, uh, living in suburbs like Woodridge, Logan Central, Barren Bar and Kingston, it'll be easier for them to come to this satellite hospital than it will to be go for them to go to the Logan Hospital. Uh, so it will mean more services closer to people in the community and that's what the satellite hospitals are all about. Uh, of course the 100 construction jobs that this project will support uh, is another example, will be uh, another project, another example of how uh, we are supporting uh, construction uh, in our economy as we 
come through COVID-19. And construction has barely stopped during the Omicron wave. It has surged through the Omicron wave, continuing to support jobs. The latest housing approval data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics in December shows house approvals are up 31% compared to May 2020. So that's when uh, the uh, first wave of uh, uh, the virus really started striking Queensland. And it's been even stronger in the Logan Bow Desert area with house approvals up 50% year on year. So this is another investment in healthcare, but it's also an investment in jobs and our local economy. Our government is planning and building for the future. And this smart infrastructure and smarter healthcare uh, are yet another example of that. I'm so pleased to be here today with the Premier, Deputy Premier, Treasurer and Health Minister to to announce that we've identified the preferred site for our Southside Satellite Hospital. Located in Eight Mile Plains, this is a huge win for my community. Securing the preferred site is an another important milestone in this project. A new satellite hospital for the Southside means even stronger healthcare and jobs during construction and beyond. I know the Southside has had significant growth and as the member, I have to say, it's the place to be. The Palaszczuk government continues to deliver services in the south side needs. Now, the, now is the right time to invest in additional infrastructure to make sure the residents in this area continue to receive uh, maximum health care. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Corinne and James are also uh, with us here today. So are there any questions on the satellite hospitals? We're aiming as quickly as possible to get these up and running. So um, I think everybody uh, on my team has been made very well aware of how I want these delivered as quickly and safely as possible. The total budget for all of them from memory is around 265 million. Yep. Okay, any other questions? All good? I'm not, I know, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no? Like what? In, in relation to what? Oh, in relation to the issues. Oh, I think in relation to those issues, I, um, I went through that quite clearly yesterday that uh, there are some matters before the Triple C. There are matters before the committee. I would love to discuss more details, uh, but I would be in uh, contempt of parliament and I would be um, in breach of some of my legal obligations if I said anything more in relation to those matters. I said very clearly yesterday, I would like these issues resolved as quickly as possible. I think that will give the public confidence. Premier, uh, Nine, and, News, has, yeah, Nine yeah. News has been told that uh, there are no matters regarding Dr Stefanov before any parliamentary committee other than her five-year review. That's not my understanding, um, but you should speak to the chair of the committee. Yeah, look, that's a really good question, um, Lydia, and I'm more than happy um, to once again, because you weren't um, there, there yesterday, just to refresh everyone's um, mind and memory about what the Solicitor General said to me. Because, can I say, um, I pride myself in acting in accordance with the law and discharging my legal obligations uh, according to that. The Solicitor General, uh, provided uh, advice to me and that advice said, and I'll uh, relate, say this again, in my view, the primacy of the parliamentary committee's oversight role means that the committee is the appropriate body to consider whether allegations concerning the conduct of the QIC, regardless of the relative seriousness of these allegations and regardless of whether they constitute misconduct under the Integrity Act, warrant investigation. So I have absolutely discharge my obligation that I was required to do. Did you receive correspondence? Uh, you, uh, what I will say to that uh, question, and it is very clear that the Solicitor General had all of the information, the necessary information before him, 
before making uh, the decision uh, to 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 give me the advice that required the referral. I would like to see this issue resolved as quickly as possible, just like everyone else. I would like to come here and freely discuss all of these issues, but I can't. I respect the committee process. But when did you, oh, um, when did you receive, or did you receive correspondence from the Triple C before you made the referral? Did I personally receive? Or did, were you aware of the correspondence from the Triple C? I, all I can say is the Solicitor General had all of the advice in front of him before he provided me with the advice that the referral had to go. And like I said yesterday, it doesn't matter whether it's small, medium or large, these matters require me under the Act as the responsible minister to refer them. And the committee has options open to them. The committee could choose to investigate. The committee could choose to um, say no further action. You would have to ask the committee those questions. I cannot disclose um, correspondence from the committee and I cannot disclose um, matters that were discussed before the committee. When did you first, oh sorry, when did you first become aware of the interference allegation? In, in, parti in particular? And in to do with the integrity commissioner about the PSC. When did you become aware? Sorry, in relation to, you've got to be very specific here because there's a lot of issues around and I don't want to be in contempt, okay? So, when did the Dr. Stepanov first, when did you become aware that Dr. Stepanov had raised questions and concerns about interference from the public service? Okay, my understanding there is that I think there was um, a report in the Courier Mail, I think from memory, it was around September last year. Was the person who brought you the complaint about the integrity commissioner that you referred on, the person who made the complaint to begin with? Can you repeat that question so I can... I can was the person who brought the matter to your attention the person who made the complaint to begin with? I can't discuss um, who has made the complaint. All I can say is the Solicitor General had all of the information before him and he provided me with the clear advice that the matter, regardless of whether it was deemed small, medium or large, the right thing for me to do was refer that matter. I want answers to this as quickly as possible as well. Now, obviously, there are matters before the committee. I cannot talk about those matters. Did you think it was strange that someone brought this matter to you two years after it had allegedly happened and after the Triple C had dismissed it? The Solicitor General had all of the advice provided to him and he, he he gave me the clear advice after he had all of the advice in front of him that I had to act. But did you think it was and it was clearly up to the, the committee, the committee to either uh, investigate it, dismiss it, or ask for further questions. They are questions for the committee. Premier, Dr Stepanov issued a statement this morning saying yes. it's entirely expected that as part of any meaningful change process there will be ebbs and flows. Is it fair that she's been put under so much pressure and scrutiny right now? Oh, as I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, I absolutely respect the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. Uh, it is an office that um, uh, provides um, confidential advice. It is uh, an office that is highly regarded, and I absolutely respect that office. Given that the Triple C has already investigated the matter and the timing of the referral in relation to uh, Dr Stepanov's allegation, do you think you would use to try to enlighten a new investigation into her? Uh, can I just say once again, all of the information was before the Solicitor General. That advice was to me to make the referral and that's what I had to do. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a small matter or a big or whatever because it's the, it's the committee that has the oversight of the Integrity Commissioner. The Not me, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the committee. But that's a, no. But why would they? Because if, if she has made a complaint, they wouldn't be referred to me. Yeah. Yeah. I have to just. I, I have to abide by and respect the institutions. So as I said uh, yesterday, uh, my understanding is that there are matters, some matters before the Triple C, and my understanding is that there are some matters before the Parliamentary Committee. Is it, is it the matters... And that's a couple more because I really have to go to Cabinet, yeah. Are they the matters about her, her misconduct allegations Josh, or are they other matters? I mean, I can't say. I'm sorry. I'd, I'd love to tell you more. I don't know 
exactly the extent of her allegations. That's a matter for her. But I would like these resolved as quickly as possible in the public interest. I absolutely would like to see a resolution to all of these issues as quickly as possible. Well, that's a matter. For, that's that's a matter. That's a matter for them. Yep. So you'd have to ask the the committee. Just quickly on, on, on another matter. Just yep. up in Cairns, there's been a, a terrible road accident. There's um, oh, uh, yep. teenagers in a car. A uh, 14 year old boy has died. Are you concerned that it's getting out of control? Like what's uh, well, Josh, I've only just heard, heard about that. That's um, a tragedy for any loss of life on our roads, especially a young life. Um, and, you know, once again, we just need people to, you know, be safe on our roads. I don't know the exact circumstances. I'm, I'm happy to ask the Transport Minister to look into that. Yeah, well, that's not on. Like, like honestly, I mean... Um, we have put on uh, extra police. I know the police try their hardest, um, but you know these 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 young people should be at home with their with their parents or loved ones. They should be in loving loving families, not out on the roads and not at that age. Um, you know, someone's lost their life here. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, so the committee reported once on Friday about the evidence bill. Yes. Yep. Uh, basically the evidence that the committee had received was that there's further um, investigation to occur to amendments to the Triple C Act and uh, once that occurs then um, that uh, matter of, of shield laws in relation to um, those closed hearings or uh, the hearings that the Triple C conduct um, can be canvassed at that time. Um, the difficulty with uh, answering your question is that we don't know what happens at the Triple C because that's the way the Triple C is structured. It's a completely, um, uh, you know, private and uh, confidential uh, um, method by which they gather their evidence. Um, so I can't, you know, I can't anticipate how many journalists. Uh, uh, in jeopardy because the shield laws haven't been extended to uh, confidential hearings at the Triple C. Thank you. Thank you. A question about, about the airport, if I could ask the Premier. Uh, which airport? Uh, about the Brisbane airport. Yep. The Greens saying that they wish that there was a curfew in Brisbane with the new runway. Are you going to, is there any leeway to My understanding that that's a happen? matter for uh, the Federal Government. The DP might be more aware. Yeah, it's Federal. Yep. Yep. Happy to write a letter to the Federal Government about it. Yep. Okay, thanks everyone, thanks for coming.